Welcome to Apologetics from the Attic, the show that seeks to teach and defend the Christian faith in a post-Christian culture. And now, broadcasting from an attic in an undisclosed location somewhere outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here is your host, Dave Lewis. Hello and welcome to another edition of Apologetics from the Attic. This is Dave Lewis, your host, on this June 1st, 2020. And let's pray the collect for Pentecost, as yesterday was Pentecost Sunday. Let us pray. Almighty God, on this day, through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you revealed the way of eternal life to every race and nation. Pour out this gift anew, that by the preaching of the gospel, your salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but we're living in historic times, aren't we? I mean, it was coronavirus for a couple months. 104,000 people have died. And now we have these uh, race riots all across the country. I mean, I'm going to throw up this slideshow, if you're watching, of the images of what's been going on across our country. Looting, burning, violence, destruction. How do we as Christians understand this? What is the Lord speaking to us? Do we believe that the Lord is speaking to us through this? I mean, this is where theology matters, right? If you've grown up in the bosom of the American Evangelical Church, you functionally believe what's called moralistic therapeutic deism. Basically, God's here to teach us morals, how to be nice people. He's here to give us therapy, meaning that he puts his hand on our shoulder when we're upset and helps us cope with life like a therapist in the sky. But we're deists, meaning functionally God's there, but he's kind of wound this thing up. So events like this, riots and destruction, God's kind of up in heaven noticing it. He's beholding it. He has perfect knowledge of it. And he may intervene here and there. But in general, this is kind of just human free will run amok. God's sovereignty, God's decree, God's purposes, God's plans have nothing to do with this. This is pure moral evil whose only root is libertarian free will. So this is why the American church is crippled from speaking into this prophetically, from speaking into this in a way where we see God is moving, God is on the move, God is speaking, His Holy Spirit is speaking. These events are orchestrated by His sovereign decree to bring judgment. That's the other thing. Do we believe in a God of judgment? Do we believe that human beings can be instruments of His judgment? Do we believe what it says in the Old Testament where God brought wicked people as instruments of judgment upon the people of Israel, the Assyrians, the Babylonians? How do we understand this? Do we as Christians have anything to say? Because see, right as this is happening, the churches are starting to reopen. Churches are starting to, to open back their services. Pastor, what is your message? Are we just trying to get back to normal and tell everyone... Be happy, healthy, wealthy Americans living your best life now? Or are we proclaiming a prophetic message of sin and repentance, the holiness of God? Are we, are we preaching a message where we as Americans have taken for granted the blessings that God has brought upon this country and the seeds that we've sown as a nation are coming upon us and God's judgment is being revealed through a global pandemic and now through nationwide riots. I mean, 
if you're watching these pictures and it's 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 unbelievable it's unbelievable i mean this this makes i mean what it happened in baltimore um it happened in um ferguson and that was just one city at a time this is like 150 cities across the country this is happening so I want to read a passage, and then I want to go over Peter's Pentecost sermon. So I want to keep this episode within an hour, though. But I want to read the book of Revelation 18 and walk through it for a moment. Now, I hold to what's called the idealist view of the book of Revelation. It's one that makes most sense to me. Am I, am I wedded to it as a uh, dividing doctrine? No. Uh, look that up, the... There's the historicist, the idealist, the preterist, and the uh, futurist views of the book of Revelation. I like the idealist view. I think it makes the most sense. So the idealist view says that the images in the book of Revelation are what's going on in the history as the kingdom of God, the end times come upon us since the ascension of Christ all the way through to the end. So... These are what's happening on planet Earth continually from the vantage point of the heavenly realm and the unfolding of God's decree. And as the Son of God breaks the seals, blows the trumpets, and pours out the bowls, which he's been doing since his ascension, this is what happens on planet Earth. Now, Revelation 18 is a prophecy against Babylon. And America represents uh, the systems of America, the, the hijacking of America by secularism, by um, leftism, by um, materialism, by all kinds of different isms, where, you know, the rule of God's law, Christian values has been set aside uh, prayer has been ripped from public schools. There's no Bibles in public schools. Children are not raised um, under scriptural authority and believing in God. So that's where we are. And this is the result. This is the result. Then I heard another voice. This is Revelation 18 verse 4. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as queen, I am no widow. And mourning I shall never see. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day. Death and mourning and famine. And she will be burned up with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. Mm. So, did you hear that from the scriptures? Babylon represents a society a system of the world that is about luxurious living in this life. It's about materialism. Um, it's about uh, living in such a way where you're living for this life and for this world. And God is going to judge her. And this happens in the history of humanity. God brings his judgment upon the nation that that says they have no need of him because they live for this world, this life material possessions and pastor christian we must understand that god is shaking this nation to get us to see that we must repent starting with us as believers not being preachy and telling all these other people need to repent no we need to repent as peter says judgment starts with the household of god we've lived for this world we as Christians sometimes are indistinguishable. I have to hang my head in shame. You have to hang your head in shame. We are indistinguishable from the materialism around us. 
We Christians have the same priorities as the world. We want our nice house in the suburbs. We want our nice brand new cars. We want our nice clothes. We want, we want to live like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, and have all the world's values. And God is saying, repent. He's saying, what is he saying? He's saying, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore, cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and slaves, that is human souls. <laughs> I'm going to say a lot about that. But the global economy is grinding to a halt. This isn't going to make it any better, by the way. I mean, we were just getting to the place as a country where we're going to start reopening coronavirus. Have you noticed coronavirus is knocked completely out of the news cycle? I mean, watch CNN, watch Fox News. Not even a mention of it, really. It's unbelievable. Like, it's completely gone from the news cycle. It's It's crazy. And 40 million people unemployed. We're, we're still not even close to understanding the implications of what the, sh the forced shutdown of businesses had with, with the economy. And now we have this. And if this continues to go on, I mean, you know, we're going to be at a place where this is going to crush the economy even more. All these businesses being looted and all this destruction. And the world looks on and says, this is the most wealthy nation in the history of humanity, the United States of America. And we see the smoke of her burning, rising. I mean, did you see, uh, they were, you know, there's that picture right there, the White House. I mean, they were all around the White House. They lit on fire. I still haven't heard yet if it burned all the way down. St. John's Episcopal Church was a, was a, is a historic, from the 1800s, Episcopal Church in the nation's capital, was lit on fire. Absolutely unbelievable. The revelation continues. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off, in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels, and with pearls. And for in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. I mean, does that fulfill what's going on right now? Our wealth is being laid waste. And, of course, who's responsible for this according to the book of Revelation? God. It says... For God has remembered her iniquities. God has remembered her iniquities. And it continues. It just conti it continues. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and whose trade is on the sea, stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like this great city? And they threw dust on their heads, and they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Wow. And then, the, the, so the saints and the apostles and the prophets, um, and, you know, and the revelation makes this distinction between the church triumphant and the church militant. Uh, so this may be a reference to the church triumphant who earlier in the book of Revelation cried out, How long, O Lord, till you avenge us? And from the heavenly perspective, this is the vengeance of God that is rejoiced over, that God has given that judgment of the nation who attacks Christianity, who sidelines the truth, who mistreats the church. 
Then a mighty angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence, and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeteers will be heard in you no more. The sound of the mill will be heard in you no more, and the light of the lamp will shine to you no more. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more, for your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints, and of all who have been slain on the earth. So Babylon, of course, does this only refer to right now? Now, this is the idealist view of the book of Revelation. This, this refers to societies and nations over the history of the human race that God has brought judgment upon because of our luxury, materialism, pride, vanity, and um, living for this world and, and rejecting God and rejecting his presence and refusing to give thanks to him or glorify him instead of worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And this is the situation we find ourselves in. So the church's response to this has to be the preaching of repentance and the proclamation of the gospel. The preaching of the holiness of God, the judgment of God. The preaching of the wickedness of sin. The wickedness of the human heart. The holiness of God. I mean, this is also the final straw for many churches. Will God tolerate our churches continuing to preach and soft pedal a message God loves you and has wonderful plans for you and that's pretty much all you say every sermon's a warmed over Jeremiah 29 11 message which by the way Jeremiah 29 11 has more relevance than people realize if you read the context go back and read Jeremiah 27 28 29 30 and it's a message of God's promise to a people who experienced this is child's play compared to what those people experienced when they were exiled and sent into a foreign country, and then they received that letter from Jeremiah. I mean, their houses torched and people slaughtered in front of them and deported to a foreign country look just like this. Horrible mental images in their brain of thing, their homes on fire and things destroyed. But we need to cry out an intercessory prayer. God, raise up prophets who stand behind pulpits and say, Church, we have been wrong. We have played games for too long. We have lived in luxury. We have lived for money. We have lived to try to baptize the American dream and call it Christian and say life is about living for the here and now, for the materialism, for money. And we've rejected the cross. We've rejected to walk in humility and brokenness and, and declare our sinfulness and, and exalt the, the glory of Christ and his righteousness. And the gospel has not been proclaimed from our pulpits. The idea that Jesus is our righteousness. And he's our propitiation and he suffered in our place and in and, and rejoicing in that, in the power of the gospel. So what historic times we're living in? I mean, 2020 will go into the history books as one of the hinge turning points in the history of the world, let alone America. How much longer this will go on, I don't know. I mean... If this continues, we, we will basically turn into a police state for a while, and you will have military patrolling every major city all day, every day. You will have uniformed military officers. You will have the army and the Marines patrolling the, the streets of America to stop this. I mean, they're not going to let it keep going on. It's just going to, it's going to, at, the, at some point, it's going, something's going to have to break and they're just going to militarize everything. Um, hopefully this dies out soon. And if it doesn't, the longer this goes on, the more evidence to me that um, clearly this is the judgment of God. Clearly this is God calling us as the church out of Babylon to, to seriously consider what we're doing. 
So that's part one of this episode. Oh, only 20 minutes. Wow. So for the rest of the time, I want to do a Pentecost episode, and we're going to look at Peter's Pentecost sermon. And I want, really want to drill down on what I think was the greatest revelation that the apostles had as to what Jesus as the Messiah and as they looked back at the scriptures, what the hermeneutic, the, the principle of interpretation of the Old Testament scriptures, what really was the key that, that changed their entire mind. So I'm, I'm, I just want to focus on Peter's sermon, the content of his sermon, not necessarily you know, the Holy Spirit falling and what that means and speaking in tongues and, and all of that. Um, although it is, it is quite interesting to, to, to talk about all of that. Um, so I have the, the text up here. Um, Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Acts two fourteen. So I just want to walk through this text and make a few comments. And then we can be done with this episode. But Peter, standing along with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Okay, so what's going on? Okay, they're speaking in tongues. And, you know, the debate, the debate in, uh, you know, the Pentecostals, Charismatics versus Cessationists, whatever, you know, there's all kinds of ways you can flesh out this debate. Uh, But the 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 speaking of tongues the speaking of other languages Um, is it a miracle of speaking or a miracle of hearing Uh, because you know it says that they're speaking in these other tongues and everyone's hearing the word of god the glorifying of god in their own language now from a biblical theology perspective in terms of walking through the text of scripture from beginning to end and building up a doctrine Versus systematic theology, which is different, which is of going through and piecing together different different texts into topics. Anyway, the 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 difference between biblical theology and systematic theology is an interesting one. From a, from a biblical theology perspective, you have to put the fulfillment of the reversal of the Tower of Babylon in your thinking when you look at this text, because you know where whereas in the the Tower of Babel, you have one language that the people are speaking, and then God comes down and confuses the languages. So now everyone speaks a different language and they can't understand each other. The day of Pentecost, you have a reversal. You have many languages represented, and one language is spoken and everyone can understand it. So there's, in other words, there's a bigger picture here going on as far as a fulfillment of what's going on. So there's a, when, when, and, and, and what does this witness to? That the new covenant, the gospel of the kingdom, the ascension of Christ and the sending of his spirit ushers in this new situation where now the message of the gospel will go forth across the earth to all languages. This is really going on. But anyway, the, there's mockers who say, well, they're just drunk. That's what's going on. They're drunk. They had a bunch of wine this morning, and they're, they're all wrecked. And, and Peter's saying, no, we're not. Now, I'm going to show you something here. Um, I want to put up the Greek. How do I put up the Greek here? Um, is the primary translation. There we go. There we go. So, um, and... So he quotes the prophet Joel. This is quite interesting. Um, He quotes the prophet Joel, but Luke records a massive quote from the prophet Joel when, you know, he could have just quoted this first part uh, because Peter's point was basically, look, um, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. But then he continues to quote it because he's going to make a point not about that current experience necessarily of signs and wonders, but he's going to, of course, as the apostles will do, and as any true preaching does, points back to Jesus. 
So it reads, And in the last days it shall be God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapors of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, the understanding of this text by the majority of the Jews of, of Peter's day would be this is the prophecy of the cataclysmic end of the world when the Messiah will come and redeem Israel and destroy her enemies and redeem the creation and there will be a new heavens and new earth. And that event has not come yet in the Jewish mind. But for Peter and the apostles, this event has happened. And now we are in the last days. And then if you've ever heard of it, the hermeneutic that, that is pretty much agreed upon by all New Testament scholars is we're in, it's called the already and the not yet. So there's a split in two of the Jewish expectation where the kingdom of God has come into the present because of the incarnation, life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and session of the, of, of the Son and the sending of the Spirit that has ushered in the last day. So it's, it's proper to say, if someone asks you, are we in the end times? The correct answer is yes, we've been in the end times since the day of Pentecost or since the ascension of of Christ, we've been in the last days. These are the last days. Well, so you're saying there's not a cataclysmic event? Well, that's where you get into the debate between preterists and, and futurists. What does the last days look like? And is there going to be a cataclysmic event? Is there going to be a literal antichrist who, who rises to power and a one world government and a one world system? All this stuff. But even if you clear out all those debates, I think everyone in that debate would agree that these the last days the kingdom of god coming is represented by the first coming of christ and now the presence of christ on this planet through the ministry of the holy spirit through his church through the apostles and the foundation and now the the body of christ the church militant the church as it exists as an organism on planet earth and the proclamation that they bring. Now, in verse, uh, so Peter connects to verse uh, 19, and I will give um, teras, terata, wonders, ento urano, in the heavens, kai samea, Samea, signs upon the earth. So signs and wonders, okay? Tarata and Samea. So signs and wonders in the heavens above and earth below. Sun shall be turned to darkness, moon to blood. And then look what he does with that. So he quotes this prophecy of Joel saying, listen, what you're, basically what Peter said to the crowd is, look, what you're witnessing is a fulfillment. We are in the last days. We are in the last days. That is what you are seeing. When the Holy Spirit is poured out upon his church, you are seeing the end times, the last days are coming upon you. And then he's going to, of course, toward the end of the sermon, apply verse 21. But then he says, verse 22, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs. Well, wait a minute. Interesting, right? So then he plays off of what we just looked at in, in verse 18, or um, sorry, in verse 19, signs and wonders. He applies those words to the earthly ministry of Jesus. Isn't this interesting? So for Peter, the signs and wonders prophesied by Joel that will happen in the end times have their fulfillment in the earthly ministry of Jesus. Okay, 
in the earthly ministry of Jesus because he goes because it's in you know in the Greek right here, you know, um, Jesus of Nazareth, a man displayed by God unto you in power, dunamis, uh, dunamis, kai, terasi, kai, semeois, signs and wonders. So the signs and wonders, I mean, I, I, so Joel's prophecy of signs and wonders that will come in the end times have its fulfillment in the earthly ministry of Jesus. The first time I noticed that, I was like blown away, like to, 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 to try to wrap my mind around what Peter is saying there. Signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. And of course, you know, what happened when Jesus was hanging on the cross? The sun was darkened. I mean, there were signs in the heavens as well. So there was a cataclysmic nature to the crucifixion of Christ. Now, verse 23, um, just a side issue, interesting little exegetical tidbit uh, for the Calvinist, Arminian, monergist, synergist, predestination kind of debate. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So we have two terms there. Jesus was delivered up according to what? The definite plan and foreknowledge of God. The definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Now this is what's called a Granville Sharp construction. So very quickly, if you and look that up if you want to learn about it. A Granville Sharp construction. This means that there was there was a guy, that's his name, who was a Greek scholar who discovered this rule in Greek grammar that said when there's a article, a substantive noun, chi, or the word and, and another substantive noun, many times what this means is the two nouns are referring to the same thing. And if you look at um, Mr. Wallace, Dr. Wallace's book, Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, which by the way, if you want to study Greek, you should get this, and um, this isn't just a book that only technical people can understand. There's a scripture index where you can study and look at ex exegetically significant things. So this is just a little pause. You can fast forward it about a minute and a half if you're not interested in this kind of stuff and you'd rather just walk through the text. Uh, but I want to read what Wallace says about, you know, so basically what we're asking the question is, what's the relationship between God's predetermined plan and his foreknowledge, okay? So if you look at the text, you'll see those two words occur, verse 23. Um, the the horizo boule, the determinate plan or counsel boule, and prognose, so prognosis, prognosis. Um, so we have the, the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Of course, this is the grounding reason as to why Christ was crucified and killed. It was according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. So what many will try to argue is, well, foreknowledge is describing just this bare omniscience God has where he knows the future. And the future exists in God's mind, but it has nothing to do and it is not shaped by his decree. Now there's soft forms of this view and there's hard forms of this view. Open theism and process theology would be the hardest, most extreme ver version of this. Well, God, you know, he doesn't shape human decisions at all by a predetermined plan or decree. If he knows the future, it's simply because he has omniscience and knows it. And because they, they, they make libertarian free will that which shapes what goes on in time. Um, but I just want to read this. So does this text 
define foreknowledge for us in a way that cannot exegetically be sustained by the open theist or the process theologian, or even the simple foreknowledge view. Does this text do that? I think it does. I think this text defines foreknowledge because of the, the presence of the Granville Sharp rule. Now look at it. I'm sorry if you're if you're into this. Um, there's the there's the definite article, te, um, a form of the definite article. The determined counsel, chi, and then the other noun. So two nouns. And then you have the per participial phrase. So oridzo is a verb, but it's in a participle there. And then you have boule is the noun, and prognosco, or prognosis is the noun. So you have boule and prognosco. You have these two, two words separated by chi, and then you have the definite article. That's a classic um, Granville Sharp construction. Now, if you wanted to study it, which you don't have time, let me just read this. Let me just read this. If foreknowledge defines predetermination, this opens the door that, according to one definition of prognosis, God's decree is dependent on his omniscience. But if the terms are distinguishable, the relationship may be reversed. Omniscience is dependent on the eternal decree. Without attempting to resolve this theological issue entirely, it can nevertheless be argued that the identical view is unlikely. The least attested meaning of impersonal constructions is referential identity. The relationship between the two terms here may be one of distinctness or of or the subsumption of one under the other. In the context of Acts 2 and in light of Luke's Christological argument from prophecy and pattern, the most likely option is that progon prognosco is grounded in the orizo boule. Thus, foreknowledge is part of the predetermined plan. For one of the foci of the chapter is on the divine plan in relation to the Messiah's death and resurrection. Thus, God's decree are not based on him simply foreknowing what human beings will do. Rather, humanity's actions are based on God's foreknowledge and predetermined plan. Just interesting exegetical tidbit there about the Granville Sharp construction. And um, Jesus... And then, and then we have compatibilism as well taught here. Um, we have the action of God in his definite plan and foreknowledge. That's what delivered Jesus up. Okay, Jesus wasn't delivered up to be killed, according to the apostles, because God just saw an opportunity to accomplish redemption. No, God planned this to happen from all eternity, from God's eternal counsel. This was decided. The pactum salutis. I keep talking about that. Look that up. The, the pact, the eternal pact between the triune God. So he was delivered up. But then look what it says. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So there's still a responsibility. There's still the human element that is, that is talked about here. Yes, there's this definite plan and foreknowledge of God in the delivering up of Christ to death, yet you did it through the hands of lawless men. So that's classical compatibilism. If you don't want to use that word, that's a newer word. There's debate among whether the, the first century, I mean the first generation, second generation of reformers, Calvin, and use this language. But basically, the, the two principles are God's sovereign predetermination is set alongside human actions. And they both have a reality and they both have meaning. And one doesn't invalidate the other. Okay, and that's, that's generally how the debate goes. Oh, well, if you believe in God's sovereignty, then you deny free will. And then if you deny free will, you don't, you deny God. If you believe in free will, you deny God's sovereignty. Well, this, this, this Bible kind of lays those two things next to each other and doesn't attempt to reconcile them the way we try to. Okay. Verse 24, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the, okay, so here, and okay, so here, so let me shift gears here. So here is what, here's the main point I want you to get out of this. When Jesus taught them for 40 days after his resurrection, and this, as we, and we went over this, if you go back and, and listen to the podcast, the resurrection story, according to Luke that I did, 
And we talked about the Bible study that Jesus had with the apostles and with the two men on the road to Emmaus, where he opened the scriptures to them and taught them. And he, he, what was Jesus' message? You are slow of heart because you didn't believe that the scriptures taught that the Messiah must first suffer and die and be raised again in order to enter into his glory. That there is this pattern that Jesus points them to in the Old Testament. That, you know, I've always been puzzled by this. I've just, I've had this breakthrough in the, in the last six months about uh, where this really is present. And it's present in the Psalms. The Psalms is where it's present. So now Peter quotes from a Psalm. So I believe that Jesus taught the apostles this hermeneutic that they're now going to show us. That the Psalms... Now, there's other parts of Scripture, too, but I believe that the Psalms, because they were on the lips of Jesus when he was hanging on the cross, Psalm 22, that the Psalter itself is representative of this theology of the Davidic king must suffer at the hands of his enemies, and then the promise of God will be fulfilled. But in this sense, the promise of God and when we read the Psalms now on this side of the cross and resurrection, we are to see the fulfillment of the Psalms and the psalmist being delivered from his enemies is the resurrection. Whereas when David penned these Psalms, God actually physically delivered him from his enemies through military victories and, and acts of his providence and delivered him from the hand of Saul, delivered him from the hand of Absalom. Uh, David was delivered from his enemies and he died a good old age and as an old man but the deliverance that Jesus as the true fulfillment of the Davidic king his deliverance comes in the form of his bodily resurrection and now we as believers all the promises that we hope for will be fulfilled in our own bodily resurrection in the new heavens and new earth and we are not to find fulfillment of God's promises in this life. That's the hermeneutic. So he quotes from this psalm. He says, for David says concerning him. Now what's the point he's making? Jesus' resurrection was prophesied in the psalms. And he's giving us a glimpse into what the apostles were meditating upon, what Jesus taught them during that 40 days about how to read the psalms. Now look how Peter reads this psalm. So he quotes it, okay? And he says, he says, this is Psalm 16. He says, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Now, this is a psalm of David, and this is David speaking. And normally, the hermeneutic of this psalm would be, this is David speaking, David speaking of promises that God's made to him and how God will fulfill them. Look what Peter does. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would see one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Do you see what Peter just did there? The Psalms, this Psalm in particular, and I would argue this Psalm, all 150 Psalms, are about Jesus. Because he is the seed of David that has a permanent place on the throne he is the fulfillment of the davidic covenant david so so that psalm and, and listen i want to try this experiment read through the psalms and make them all about jesus especially the parts where the psalmist is crying out god deliver me from my enemies god help me i'm surrounded i am i am in distress god deliver me and what you'll see is, and this is why the apostles couldn't take this on board till post-resurrection, 
they believe that the psalmist in the Psalms will talk about God's great deliverance of him. But of course, the natural understanding of that would be as a Jew, well, God delivered David physically. I mean, his enemies were defeated. That's why Peter and the apostles, when Jesus was arrested, they, they, they were like, well, we got to fight back here. I mean, we're like David's mighty men in the Old Testament. We're following Messiah and we, we need to fight back. We, we need to be that, that, that group that fights for the Davidic kingship. And Jesus says, no, put your sword away. And then when he gets crucified and killed, they're like, how in the world can this be a fulfillment of anything? He's dead. But then when he rises again and Jesus says, look at the scriptures again. Is the Davidic king delivered? Yes. But how? Through resurrection from the dead, the most supernatural, powerful event ever to happen. The resurrection of Christ. Now reread the Psalms. Now look at the promises. You want a fulfillment of the deliverance of the Davidic king from suffering and death and his enemies? It's child's play to say, oh, well, there was a great military battle and now we had peace in Jerusalem. No, he's been raised and now he's not seated on an earthly throne. He's seated on a heavenly throne. That's a fulfillment, ladies and gentlemen. That's the hermeneutic that the apostles, that this is the theology of the cross. In other words, the cross and resurrection is the fulfillment of the deliverance of the psalmist. If you read the Psalms this way, it will revolutionize the way you read the Psalms. I mean, I can't read the Psalms the same anymore. And I don't think the apostles could either. I think when they read the Psalms, they were like, wow, this is Jesus. All this language about the, the suffering king crying out for deliverance from God. That is Jesus. Okay, let's, let's wrap this. Okay, 46 minutes, just a couple more minutes. Let's try to get through uh, Peter's sermon here. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from his Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So he there he quotes another psalm, Psalm 110 which if I'm not mistaken is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament, Psalm 110. But once again, what's the hermeneutic that Peter's talking about? David did not ascend into heaven, but look what he wrote. So therefore the psalm is about who? Jesus. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, the preaching of repentance is strong in the apostolic proclamation here. So this is this is worth your study. The first sermon preached by Peter, and, and, and you know, it's been said and it's it's worth repeating. This is the same Peter who cowered in fear before a servant girl around a campfire outside of the where Jesus was was being arrested and, and put on trial. And now he boldly steps forward and proclaims the death, burial, resurrection of Christ and calls people to repent. And he boldly stands before and says, you people crucified the Messiah. And look at the effect of Peter's sermon. This is the effect of the Holy Spirit. You want revival? This is revival. Rev true revival is this verse. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. True revival is not you know, well, you know, all this, the Holy Spirit fell and people are falling over and convulsing and crying and weeping and, and making moaning noises and, and the music is so good and everyone's just emotional. That's not revival. True revival is a deep level of repentance and realizing our sinfulness and we're cut to the heart by how wicked we are. That's true repentance. That's real repentance according to the Bible. That's real revival, according to the Bible. That's what we need in our nation. We need a wave of the Holy Spirit to sweep over our churches and over the land and say, we are sinners. We are cut to the heart because of our sin. 
They were cut to the heart because they crucified the Messiah. Okay. And they said, Peter and the rest of the, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, because of being cut to the heart, brothers, what shall we do? And what is Peter's response? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Okay. So we, we could go into there. So, this text is so debated over baptism and baptismal regeneration and what's the role of baptism and should we baptize infants and this will come up in that. We don't need to get into that. What, what is Peter's call? Repent, meaning acknowledge your sin, admit that you deserve the judgment of God, admit that you are a sinner in the sight of a holy God, okay? And then receive the forgiveness of those same sins through the ministry of Jesus. Basic gospel proclamation. God is holy. You are sinful. Jesus Christ has come to give forgiveness to you as a sinner in the sight of a holy God. God sent his son to bring forgiveness of your sins. The proclamation that we have above anything else as believers on this earth, as ambassadors for Christ, we call people to be reconciled to God. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you. Okay. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Interesting. So this wasn't just a one time um, he preached a street preacher type sermon and then went home. No, this is a continual pleading, a continual bearing of witness with other words. It says, so, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Was there a significance to the the number 3,000? Yep. So Pentecost, remember, was a celebration of the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. That's what Pentecost is, was from the Jewish Um, mind a remembrance of what happened how many people died when Moses brought down the law from from Mount Sinai 3,000 3,000 people were slaughtered because of the sin of the golden calf now the fulfillment in the new covenant is 3,000 are saved just wanted to point that out I think that's significant I think that that's a, um, a, an interesting connection there um, that is being made by the Holy Spirit between the 3,000 that were slaughtered because of the sin of the golden calf and the giving of the law in the old covenant and now the 3,000 that are saved through the proclamation of the new covenant. And, of course, the greatest sin, much greater than the sin of the golden calf, is the sin of crucifying God, killing God, deicide, you know, homicide, the killing of a a homo sapien, deicide, the killing of a deity. Jesus Christ killed the Son of God in the flesh, the eternal Son of God, the second person of the glorious Trinity, killed. And yet that proclamation leads, or that act leads to the proclamation of the greatest news ever given, is that there is forgiveness of sins provided. Because Jesus Christ came, he lived, he died, he rose, He's seated at the right hand of the God of God. And we proclaim repentance and the forgiveness of sins. We proclaim that we are sinners who will stand before a holy God in judgment. And the only thing that will avail at that day is to be clothed in the alien, imputed righteousness of Christ, and to have the judgment of God absorbed by our substitute, Jesus, our propitiation, our sacrifice on the cross, and his resurrection. In his ascension, he takes that sacrifice and presents it to God on our behalf. What glorious news we have to bring to this world that is on fire, literally. Internally with a virus and externally in flames and looting and rioting. Beloved, what do we do? We continue to be faithful to what God has revealed to us. This world is not our home. This is not where our ultimate hope is to lie. 
this place will entirely go down in flames. And there will be a new heavens and new earth, as Peter says. But this world will be destroyed by fire. This is just a foretaste of what will ultimately happen. Let us, let us proclaim repentance and faith. Let us proclaim, let us pray, let us intercede that the body of Christ, the church militant on this earth, will come together on one accord and proclaim repentance and the forgiveness of sin and the holiness of God and the futility of materialistic things in this life and living for this world. And we should be living for eternity and building our treasures in heaven. So thank you for this Pentecost 2020 episode of Apologetics from the Attic. Please like and share, subscribe. Thank you, and God bless. Mm-hmm.